Amen. Amen. Please grab a seat. Good to have you at church tonight. Happy Father's Day uh, from me to all the dads out there who are here tonight. I, uh, I must say that I am a father now. So there we go. Little Audrey's down the front. I've literally done nothing in the four weeks of her life to deserve a Father's Day, but uh, that's all right. I'm claiming it anyway. That's good. Uh, apparently kids are good for sermon illustrations, as so the other guys tell me. Uh, but to be honest, she, she hasn't given me any material yet uh, in her four weeks, which is a bit disappointing. I'm going to try and milk it for all it's worth anyway. So here's a little picture of her if you haven't met Audrey before. Maybe, maybe I can't milk it for all it's worth. Oh, oh there it is. Oh, very good. This is little Audrey. That's her, that's her Insta shot. And the next one's a bit of real life parenting for those who haven't had a kid yet. Uh, you can figure what that is. That's good. <laughs> Being a, a parent is beautiful. It is. I want to say that it's beautiful. And it is also really good for my prayer life. I want to tell you, I, didn't, I haven't normally been one to pray in the middle of the night, but I've found myself in the last four weeks doing a little bit more praying in the middle of the night. The tenor is usually, God, please, help her to sleep. And, uh, and on a few occasions in the middle of the night, as I've been praying, I've really wondered, what would it be like? What, what would Jesus be like in this situation? Have you ever wondered that in your life? I would love to know how Jesus would have reacted in the middle of the night, uh, you know, awoken to put a, a baby back to sleep. I, I would love in so many situations of my life to see the beauty of his life wholly surrendered to the Father and how that plays out in everyday realities. Don't you ever wonder what, how Jesus would go, what, how he would react if he got cut off in traffic? Do you ever wonder that? I wonder things like that. Uh, do you ever wonder how Jesus would relate to, to family and to friends, how, what he'd be like at a family gathering? You ever wonder what Jesus would be like when he got up first thing in the morning? I wonder those sort of things. Wonder what he'd be like at the end of tonight, you know, as we're all leaving. What would Jesus be doing then? I used to have one of those wrist bands. I don't know whether you had one as well. This was a bit of a Christian craze about 15 years ago. WWJD on like really colourful band, little print. It means what would Jesus do? And the whole idea is that you sort of keep, um, you know, looking at that bracelet and asking that question of yourself. But a lot of the time I sort of say, I don't know. I don't know what Jesus would, would do right now. I'm not sure. I would have loved to have been one of Jesus' disciples. I think they got the better end of the deal than us. They got three years with the guy and uh, they get to see what he was like in every situation of life as they followed him around. Do you ever wonder this? I, I do, I don't know whether you do. Uh, today on Father's Day, I wanna share a couple of passages from Scripture that cuts across this dilemma, this tension that we feel and hopefully opens it up for us a little bit here tonight. So we're gonna to flip to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter four and just read three verses from there and then also uh, just briefly out of chapter 11. These will be our text for tonight and uh, we've got them on the screen, I think, which is good. This is uh, Paul writing to the church in Corinth. He says this, I am not writing these things to shame you, but to warn you as my beloved children. For even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you have only one spiritual father. For I became your father in Christ Jesus when I preached the good news to you. So I urge you to imitate me. That's why I have sent Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. And uh, skipping down a few chapters in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says this, and you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. This is uh, the Word of God that we want to explore here tonight and let, let uh, grab a hold of our hearts. A theologian Bible commentator Craig Blomberg says this about these passages that we just read. He says, to command, not just to, to say, to suggest, to command the Corinthians to imitate me, as Paul does, either represents the height of presumption or reflects one of the most profound and challenging insights of all time on how to reproduce Christian disciples. I wonder what you would I think here tonight. Is Paul being arrogant here in this passage? I think in our Australian culture, we probably lean more in that direction than anything, a bit of that tall poppy syndrome, low power distance 
man, Paul's saying, imitate me, do what I do. It seems a bit rich. I wanna see if I can illustrate a little bit more to you what Paul, Paul's heart is here. When I was about 12 years old, I started to learn the drums. This was the first instrument that I'd ever learned. My parents encouraged me to learn the drums. I don't know why you'd pick the drums if you're a parent. Like they suffered for a number of years as I just banged the drums in the afternoon right next to the kitchen. Um, I don't know what, what, maybe they were just very, very merciful. But anyway, that was their, their decision to encourage me to play the drums. And so I'd, I'd have this half hour lesson once a week. And with anything, as you start out, you're pretty ordinary. I was, I was very ordinary. I had no musical ability at all, really. And uh, in these half an hour lessons, most of the time, my teacher would say, you know, get me playing. So you start, you don't start on the drums. You start on this little, they call it a practice pad. So it's just like rubber and plastic. And you just literally learn um, to use, use the sticks. And she would speak to me. She'd give me exercises to do. She'd correct me. And at the end of every lesson, what she'd do, you know, we'd just been on this little practice pad. She'd say, all right, just for the end of the lesson, I'm gonna put a song on. You can, you can sit on the real drum kit and you can just have a crack. And that was the best time of the lesson, really. Like, you don't wanna really, if you, you know, that's not playing the drums, just hitting a little plastic thing. It doesn't even make sound. Like, that was the best part of the lesson, playing the drums, awesome, at the end. But some weeks, maybe once a month, maybe a bit, bit longer than that, She'd say, actually, um, you're not gonna play at the end of the lesson today. And I'll be a bit gutted about that. But she'd say, I am going to play at the end of the lesson today. And to be honest, I was more excited about her playing than, than about me playing because she was a phenomenal drummer. Like, like we have amazing drummers in this church. She was phenomenal. Like I would be in awe as I just watched her play. And uh, she said, watch me as I play. Watch how I play, look how I do it. Now, I don't know for sure, but I don't think my drum teacher was choosing to play on these particular occasions because she wanted little 12-year-old Matt Sweetman to see how good she was. I hazard a guess that's not why she was playing on those times. I think what she was trying to do was to give me a vision for what it looked like to really play the drums give me a vision for where I was headed. She would, she would say, hey, watch me as I play. Watch what I do. She was trying to help me. She was trying to encourage me, inspire me and teach me. And this is where Paul's at. You see, Paul's heard reports back that the Corinthians are still infants in Christ. They're not growing up at all in the faith. There's not much fruit of the Spirit at all. There was arguing, divisions, sexual immorality, problems when they gathered, people were getting drunk at communion, like crazy stuff. Really, really horrific stuff that, that Paul's sort of wondering about. But Paul doesn't just sit there and sort of say, oh, well, like oh, Corinthians, you know what I mean? The loving thing that he does as a father, what, he's, what we've just read, is to take responsibility for their growth. It's to not just see where they're at and say, oh, that's, that's a bit of a shame. No, no. What does a father do when they see their child struggling? He says, I'm gonna take responsibility for this situation. I'm gonna lend my strength. I'm gonna lend my resource, my power. And so he says, Corinthians, look at my life, which is an image of Christ. He says, follow my example. This is like what the, my drum teacher did for me. Watch what I do, see the heart that I do it with, learn how I do it. He sets forth his life as a vision to empower and inspire them to also live likewise. What he's actually doing is he's, he's giving the Corinthians a line of sight to Jesus. You know how we were talking before about we'd love to see Jesus, you know, what he'd do today. That's what Paul's doing for the Corinthians. He's giving them a line of sight to Jesus. We actually uh, read in Scripture that this is stock standard stuff for Paul. Over six, seven times in his letters to four different churches, he says in different ways pretty much the same thing. Imitate me, follow my example. Everything you've seen me do, you should do that as well. Do what I do, live as I live. I want you to notice as well that uh, here in the text, Paul doesn't just say this casually. He 
He doesn't just say, look, oh, if you want, you, you can look at my life. Like, no biggie if you don't, but sort of here's my life. You can, you can have a look. The Greek word here, we actually read it. He says, I urge you. He, he makes a plea. He makes an appeal to the Corinthians. This is strong language that Paul's using. Clearly, something is at stake here. Why does Paul care so much? What's at stake here is that uh, the Corinthians are actually not taking a hold of what Christ had given to them. In fact, uh, what Christ can give to everyone. We read in the Gospels in particular uh, that Christ said he came to give us new life. The word that he used for it is eternal life. But I think we can get um, this term eternal life a bit confused as to what it means when Jesus says that. Dallas Willard explains this confusion really well in his book, The Divine Conspiracy. I know I, I mentioned Dallas quite a lot. I, I cannot recommend this book more. He explains in this book that eternal life does not just equal going to heaven when we die. That is not what eternal life is. Christ didn't just come to give us the key card to get into heaven. Christ didn't just come to give us a pass through the pearly gates. That's not why Christ came. Indeed, Jesus himself makes this crystal clear in John 6, 54. This is what Jesus says. He says, whoever eats my, blood, um, eats my flesh and drinks my blood, he's referring there to a communion, to trusting his death on the cross, has eternal life, present tense, that has is present tense, as soon as you, right now, in this moment, not in the future, right now, has eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Jesus clearly delineates here between these two concepts of eternal life and what will happen on the last day. In fact, we, we read in the Gospel of John, every time that Jesus mentions eternal life, and giving it to us and, and us receiving it, it's all present tense right now. Not, not something way off in the future that we might, you know, after we die. It's something that we actually receive now before we die. This is really important. So the question is then, what is eternal life? What, what does Scripture present eternal life as? Well, it presents it as a new way are to be alive, a new way of living. It's a type of existence where we actually live like God. We become as God is. We take on the heart and the character of God. In the garden, um, um, Satan said to Eve, he said, oh, if you eat of the fruit, you will be like God. What a lie, what a lie. Complete deception. Sin takes us to death. Jesus says, I will give you that eternal life. I have the capacity to, to give you what you need to be like God. Not be God, be like God, to take on God's heart. I wanna show you this in Scripture. I'm gonna give you three Scriptures. I would have loved to have put them in a PowerPoint, but just follow along with this. John 17, 3, Jesus defines eternal life as this. Now, this is eternal life, that they know you, the Father, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's what eternal life is, to know God. John then goes on to say in 1 John 4, 7, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. So are you, are you sticking with that? Eternal life is to know God and God is love. And so to love others is what it actually means to know God. Really important. Uh, John reaffirms this in, in chapter three, verses 14. He says, we know that we have passed from death into life, think eternal life, because we love each other. That's what scripture says. Eternal life is to have God's heart of love towards everyone else. That's what eternal life is. Anyone who does not love remains in death. 
Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Eternal life is to love as God loves. It starts with receiving and understanding God's love for us, but that's, that's not the terminus, that's not the goal. The terminus is to actually live as God lives, to love as God loves. If God is love, get this, if God is love, and the Holy Spirit is God, that means God, God's love towards others is in you if you have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in us is a new capacity to love as God loves. And this is what's at stake at Corinth and Paul knows it. This is why he's serious. This is why he's not just um, taking what's going on lightly. See, the Corinthians had believed on Christ. They knew about his death and resurrection and believed it. They even had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the love of God. But it was not being appropriated in their life. It was not making any difference. So much of their existence was not out of a heart of love. And so Paul says, team, why are you not grabbing a hold of what Christ has gifted to you, has made possible for you to live as God lives? Why are you you living in, in ways that are so unlike God? Look at the opportunity before you to live the eternal kind of life. And so Paul says, you need need to get a fresh vision for what that looks like. Something you can follow, an example you can follow. Look at my life, he says, and imitate it. I have come to be like Christ, Paul says. Therefore, live like me and you will be living in the way of love. Uh, imitation. Philosophy, secular philosophy has long realized that human, human beings by nature, by our makeup, are beings of imitation. Plato, Aristotle were some of the first to observe this, how imitation is ig- integral to our nature. We, you here tonight, we are all imitating someone or something. It's what humans do. This is what philosopher and writer, um, David Cayley, he really succinctly gets at the issue here. He says, our wants and our abilities, so pretty much everything we are, are shaped entirely by imitation of those who surround us and those we admire. We learn because we want to be like those from whom we learn, imitation. I remember when I was young, really young, probably three, I reckon. I don't actually remember this. I just wanted to say that. I've seen a photo of me doing this, but I don't actually remember it. I I need to be up front. Uh, Of when I was young, and we actually lived here at the church. So before this building, before that building, before any of the buildings, the only building that was there at this time was the office. This was all just big acreage, lots of grass. And me and my family lived here. And uh, my dad used to do the the mowing of the uh, acreage lawn on the right on mow or whatever. Uh, but we had this backyard section which was fenced in and he'd use the hand mower for that. It was like an area where us kids used to run around in. And uh, every time my dad went out, like once a week in summer or whatever, he, he'd take the mower out. Apparently, I, I don't remember this, but apparently what I would do is, is I would follow him out and, and just walk behind him as he mowed with the hand mower, you know, going up and back, up and back. I'd just walk behind him and my mum sort of picked up on this and so she got me a mower I'm not a real mower, of course, just a little plastic one uh, that didn't cut grass. And so there, what I used to do is I used to have my little, you know, plastic mower and follow, following along behind Dad. Now, I want to ask you, ask you this. Um, do you think that I was doing that because, I mean, I don't remember, so I'm asking you. Do you think I was doing that because I thought Dad needed my help, that he couldn't really do it without me? Do you think that's why I was following along behind my dad? Of course not. Why was I following my dad? Because I wanted to be like him. He's he's a hero. He's my role model. He's who I'm looking up to. And so whatever dad does, of course, naturally, I'm going to do it. I mean, I'm not really doing it, but I'm, I'm having a crack, learning how to mow the lawn. Uh, who are you imitating right now? Who are you imitating? What are you imitating? Deep down, I want to ask you this. Who do you really want to be like? Because you are imitating someone, something. 
Jesus came from heaven to earth and revealed to us the glory of the unseen God. To give us a vision for who this God is, what He's like. But not only to give us that vision, to actually make a way for us to not only know who He is, see Him, understand who He is, but then to become like Him. Jesus says this in John 17, 22, the glory that you, the Father, have given me, Jesus, I have now given them. That's the wrong passage. That's a shame. That's okay. <laughs> That's my mistake, not theirs, by the way. It's not John 17, 22. Let me read that again. The glory that you, the Father, have given me, Jesus, I have given them. In other words, Jesus is saying, my disciples, they're now like me. And that means they're now like you, the Father. The glory of God exploded out of heaven onto the earth in Jesus Christ and it has exploded through history to us today. And so Paul is saying to the crew at Corinth, he's saying, look, if you wanna be like Jesus, I know He's in heaven right now, but if you want a vision for Him, if you wanna get a line of sight on Him, look at my life, look at my life. He's saying, you've got to get yourselves around people who are like Jesus if you want to be like Jesus. I'm one of them, Paul says. Look, whether it's me, Timothy, Timothy's great too, Apollos, I don't really care. Just get yourself around someone who looks like Jesus. Just don't float along. Don't float along. Don't get swept along by the cultural currents of Corinth. Don't get swept along by the cultural currents of Brisbane, Australia. You gotta get a vision for where God wants to take you in your life. You gotta get a vision for how deep this eternal life runs, how, how much it can change, for how great the gift is that, that Christ gave us. I know this, this grates against our individualistic, self-made culture. I've gotta, I've gotta go up myself. I'm not leaning on anyone. I'm gonna make it so that when I get to the end, I know that it was me and I didn't lean on anyone. That, that's our culture right now. But I wanna tell you, church, if you're a Christian here tonight, that's not the setup that Jesus rolled out. That's not Jesus' setup. His setup's the church. And if you're a Christian here tonight, the humble thing to do is, is, um, is to say, who's further on than me? Whose life can give me a vision for where I'm headed, for, for where I need to go, for where I want to go? I mean, we look to people for vision for all sorts of things, vision for how we work, how we dress. Your dress here tonight, that's just an imitation of someone else, really. That's what fashion is. I mean, a lot of us get a vision for how to do Instagram from others. We, we go to all these cool Instagram pages. Oh man, I'm gonna make my Instagram page like that. We're getting a vision for all these other things. Why don't we get a vision for what it looks like to be like Christ? Come on, come on. This is what's important. This is where life is. I suppose the question we need to ask is this, do we actually wanna be like Jesus? That's the question we have to start with. Because if we don't wanna be like Jesus, we're not gonna imitate those who are like Christ. Matthew 5, 6 says this, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness for they will be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst to have the heart of God, to love as God loves. Proverbs 29, 18 says, without vision, the people perish. We've got to get a vision for where we're headed, folks. And that's why I, I, what I want to say to us tonight is that we need fathers in the faith. We've got fathers in the flesh and mothers in the flesh, but we need fathers and mothers in the faith. We need peoples, people whose lives we can look at, whose lives we can study in the nitty gritty, in the rubber hits the road moments, in the mundane of everyday Brisbane, Australia life, in the challenges that come in our world today and get a vision for what Jesus would be living like in this moment. Fathers and mothers in faith who've been thoroughly transformed by the Spirit of God to be people who look like Jesus. You know, I have a father in the faith. 
I have a father in the faith. I watch how he acts. And then I ask him why he acts that way. I, I watch how he leans himself into God. I watch how he prays and I ask him why he prays that way. I watch how he yields himself to the Spirit. I watch how he, he trusts God and leans into God in moments of suffering and heartache. I watch how he responds to criticism from others. I assess his priorities in life. I see how he, he loves his wife. I see how he loves his children. I see how he loves in the church. I see how he loves outside of the church. And then I've sought and I seek to follow that example. When the gap between his life, the vision where I'm headed and my current reality is big, when it's big and I think, man, there's no way I could ever get there. I don't get discouraged. I get encouraged. The gap is an encouragement to me. You know why? Because my father in the faith has taught me that that, that gap is not a problem because we pray and we receive the empowering of the Holy Spirit and we move forward. He's taught me that God's on about, in my life, bridging that gap. That's what God's on about in my life. That's what He's taught me. But for me, He is my line of sight to Jesus right now, 21st century Brisbane, Australia, for I see the life of Christ in Him. I wanna ask you, who's your father and mother in the faith? Jesus is revealed in Scripture, absolutely. But Scripture itself presents the church, Christ's people, as the representation of Christ on the earth today. Christ is in heaven. Christ is not on earth in the flesh. Christ is in heaven. And so the Bible says, you, the disciples, you, the people, the Christians, you are Christ in context. You are Christ in situ. You are Christ in Australian culture. I wanna say, who are you imitating? Whose life is, is giving you vision to walk into all that God has for you? Whose life is a vision of what it looks like to love as God loves? Paul Peters is being baptised tonight. And uh, Paul, I'm not gonna read all of your story because you're about to uh, share it with us. But this is a bit of uh, Paul's story I just wanna share with you. He says this, I was fortunate to grow up in a Christian home something I am very grateful for. From a young age, I was introduced to church, Sunday school, community of believers in Christianity. But get this, I love this. To this day, my dad, I think your dad's here tonight, Richard. Praise God. To this day, my dad is probably one of the best examples and role model of the Christian walk and trust in God. What a beautiful thing when dads are not just fathers in the flesh, but fathers in the faith. What a beautiful thing that is. And what a beautiful thing it is when sons in the flesh don't just look to their fathers as fathers in the flesh, but look to them as fathers in the faith. That's a beautiful thing. I wanna say, if you're a parent here tonight, you have the most unique opportunity ever to influence your children and give them an example of what it looks like to be Christ, to love as God loves, to have eternal life. One Peter, he's speaking to the elders, but I just wanna translate it to parents tonight. He says, elders, just be careful, don't lord it over them. Set an example, don't corner them, don't force them. I know the, the, there's blurred lines there when we're parenting, we, but we don't force them, we don't corner them, we set an example that, that we invite them into. If you're a child here tonight, if you have a parent who is godly, who is mature in Christ, who is like Christ, I wanna say, you should be following their example. You should be imitating them gonna move you forward in becoming like Christ, like God, loving as God loves. But even if you don't have that opportunity here tonight, I just wanna encourage you that that doesn't matter. This is why Jesus rolled out the church because here tonight, we are family. We are family. This is what's so powerful about the local church. Online's good. Look, I, I, I listen to sermons online I follow people online, but I wanna tell you, this is where the rubber hits the road in the local context where you actually see their life. If you listen to a sermon online, you might get a bit of teaching, but you have no idea what, what that person's like in real life. You need to be careful with that. This is the place where you need to find a father and a mother or a mother in the faith. 
And so I wanna, I wanna call us tonight as a church. This is what I believe God wants to say to us tonight. Here in this place, we need fathers and mothers in the faith who will stand up and take responsibility. Not just watch as children drift along with cultural currents and say, oh, well, I can't, can't really do too much about that. No, to say, I'm going to step in here, not force anything, but provide an example and say, hey, look, you can look at my life. Come and look at how I follow Jesus. Come and look at how He's transformed my life. This is what Christ did for us. Christ didn't just sit in heaven and say, oh, wow, shame about that. No, He said, I'm gonna step up to the plate. I'm gonna take responsibility. I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna fix what the problems are, even though they weren't problem, His problems to begin with. Church, we need fathers and mothers in the faith in this place who are gonna rise up, take responsibility. And secondly, we need children in the faith who are going to honour that, who are gonna honour that witness, who are not just gonna say, oh, whatever, cool, um, that's good that you live that way. No, no, no. Follow the example set by mothers and fathers in the faith. And by following them, come to be like God, for this is eternal life, to love as God loves. I think we're um, gonna sing a song in a second. So uh, if the um, team wanna come back up, that'd be awesome. But the ways uh, that we respond here tonight, this is how we respond to God's word. The first thing um, is if you are here tonight and you do hunger and thirst to actually be like Christ, that's not just a surface level thing that you say some of the time, you genuinely desire to be like Christ. You hunger and thirst for righteousness. You say, oh God, there's, there's parts in my life right now that I know don't reflect your character, but please come and, come and help me, come and change them. If that's your heart cry tonight, you need to get a father or a mother in the faith. That's what you need to do. It, it, it's not like a take it or leave it thing. It, it's an essential thing if you wanna move forward. You need to get a vision for what it looks like to be yielded, filled, full up with the Holy Spirit and how that changes everything in our lives. You need to get a vision for it and then you need to imitate it. You need to, to talk with them, sit with them regularly, look at their life as, as much as you possibly can. If you don't know who that person might be here tonight, if, if no one really is in your sphere that you know, yeah, I can, that can be that person for me. What I wanna say is all you need to do is genuinely cry out to God to provide that person to you. Because I wanna tell you, God's gonna answer that prayer every day of the week, every minute of every day of the week. That's, that's what He wants to do. That's the setup that Christ rolled out. But at the same time, we need to be proactive. Paul doesn't just say, look, He's urging them, He's pleading, please imitate me, imitate me. He, he's calling them to action. And so one thing, one, two things that you can do to be proactive. If you don't have a mother or the father in the faith, the first is come to corporate prayer meetings. You know why? Because that's where they like to hang out. That's where the mothers and the fathers in the faith, that's where they like to be. On their knees, crying out to God for His help. In fact, this was what my father in the faith told me. This was his bit of advice as I was talking to him about this tonight. He said, look, if someone's looking for someone, just tell them to come to a corporate prayer meeting. I think it is so true, it's so true. You'll find someone there, God will provide someone for you there. The other thing that you can do is to, to talk to one of us pastors. We love to just help you on that journey and direct you to people. It's the first way you can respond tonight. The second, there's a word as well for people who are mothers and fathers in the faith here tonight in this place, in this church. God's call tonight to mothers and fathers in the faith, fathers and mothers, is to imitate Christ. And the way that you do that, as someone who's mature, is to step up and take responsibility. And the way that we need to do that, this is really important. We live in an individualistic culture where no one ever really sees each other hardly. We drive into our garages, close the door, and then it's just real close. What we need to do is we need to provide access to our lives, availability to our lives, transparency, authenticity. We're not perfect. Paul's not saying he's perfect. I wanna make that really clear. Paul even says to the Philippians, he says, look, I haven't got there yet, but I'm pressing on to take a hold of what Christ took a hold of me for. 
He's saying, I desire to move forward. But I do wanna say, if you have walked with Jesus for a period of time, you have something to give. You don't need to have it all together. One thing you need to teach children in the faith is, faith is how to repent, how to receive God's forgiveness when, when we do go the wrong way. Really important. We need to give access to our lives and we need to be careful not to force things upon people. We just humbly and gently say, look, this is my life. Follow my example if you wish. Urge them, plead them. I would love you to follow my example, but, but we never force. This is what the Bible's clear on as well. And finally, uh, if you're not a Christian here tonight, maybe all of this is a little strange to you. You know, these mothers and fathers in the faith, you're sort of not quite sure about this concept. Maybe you're, you're not a Christian here tonight. I wanna say, if you want to receive this new life that, um, that God and Christ says that they can give you, you, you can receive it tonight. You don't need to go off and do a course. You don't need to have read the Bible back to front. You can actually receive a new type of existence, a new way to be human tonight where you take on the character of God, where your heart at the moment, which is really inward and, and all about what you're getting out of life, it, it turns outward and it says, hey, I'm gonna, I just can't help myself but loving others. You can receive that tonight. All you need to do is receive the forgiveness that's on offer in, in Jesus Christ through the power of His blood that was given for us on the cross. Know that He rose again by the power of the Spirit. Receive that forgiveness from God, ask for it, and then ask Him to fill you with His Holy Spirit and He will do it tonight. You don't need to wait till tomorrow. You don't need to wait at all. In fact, tonight you can have a new type of existence. That is incredible. I think that's incredible. I'm gonna pray. And then uh, we're gonna go to the baptism in just a second, but we're gonna sing a bit of a song through this baptism. We sang it last week, The Blessing, a beautiful song. It's actually a prayer. It's less of a song of worship to God and a prayer that we pray. It's the ironic blessing comes out of Scripture. And uh, the way I want us to receive this song tonight is to hear it as a prayer that Christ originally prayed and every saint, every disciple since then has prayed for the next generation. They, they've prayed, God, make Your face shine upon them, pour out Your blessing on them so that they may know You, so that they may come like You. And as the team sing that, I want you to receive that and hear that prayer that's echoed through history in the church and comes to us today and praise God for that prayer. Say, thank you, God, that people have prayed this for, for the last thousands of years, the last 2,000 years. That's the first way I want you to receive that song. And the second is this. At some point, if you're a Christian, Maybe you're just a brand new Christian and you're thinking, uh, you know, I'm probably not at a point where people are gonna be imitating my life right now. Um, if you stick with God, if you stick with Jesus, you will at some point reach that place. And so the second way we need to pray, we need to sing this song is as a prayer over those who are gonna go after us and say, God, again, the next generation. We wanna be imitators for the next generation. We want, we want to give them something that they can look to. I'm, pr I'm singing it, I'm praying it over my daughter tonight. That's what I'm doing. You, you pray it over people in your life that you say, God, I want, I want you to grab a hold of their life. I want you to uh, make them like you as well. Uh, we're gonna sing that song. Then we're gonna go to a story and a baptism which speaks of this eternal life, this new life that God gives us. So let's pray together. In fact, let's stand, we'll sing a bit of this song and then you're good. Well, God, thank You, thank You that You didn't just leave us in the mess that we're in. You said, I'm gonna step up to the plate, I'm gonna take responsibility, I'm gonna do what I need to do to turn this humanity, turn these people around, turn me around, turn us around. So that rather than taking on the, the character and the nature of the devil, we can now take on the character and the nature of the living God to love as He loves. Thank You, God. Thank You, Jesus, for doing what You did. You completed the work. You said it is finished, so now we can receive eternal life. Maybe even now, if you're a Christian, just hold out your hands and say, Holy Spirit, have more of me here tonight. I thirst, I hunger to take on Your character, God. It's His Holy Spirit in us, which is the power that we need to yield to, to give run of the house to. So let's yield again to Him tonight. Let's receive this, this prayer as a blessing over us and sing it over those who will go after us as well. You can be seated where you are. 
Oh, well, Paul, it is such a privilege to be sharing in this baptism with you, your wife Amelia here as well. Uh, when Paul actually wanted to get baptised back before all the COVID stuff started, but um, God had a plan and a purpose that this Father's Day, we would be here together in the pool, hearing this message about fathers and mothers in the faith, and your testimony is powerful, declaration of that. And you, um, taking this step of obedience and faith today is a powerful testimony not just to your own family and friends, but to all of us as a church. And so I want to say thank you, Paul, for your willingness to do that, your humility, your example. And I know that you've got many family and friends who have come today as well, especially for the baptism. I know they're down the front here. Just give us a wave if you've come out especially for it. Can we welcome them, church? A big welcome. So good to have you here. Particularly to Paul's mum and dad. So great to have you here tonight as well, but the whole family. And so, Paul, would you share with us your story? would be fantastic. Thank you, Nathan. Um, yeah, so I'm almost 50 years old, and um, I would like you to share. I'd like to share my faith journey with you. Uh, I was born in South Africa. Uh, my father came from an atheist family, but became a believer and a Christian uh, when he married my mother. I grew up in a Dutch Reformed church and was baptized as, as a baby, as the custom is in the Dutch Reformed church. I was fortunate to grow up in a Christian home. Uh, something I'm very grateful for. From a young age, I was introduced to church, Sunday school, community of believers, and Christianity. To this day, my dad is probably one of the best examples of the role model of a Christian walk and trust in God. Also, as the custom is in the Dutch Reformed Church, I did my profession of faith at the age of 16. Again, I was fortunate to have an elder at the time that guided me and told me that I can have a personal relationship with Jesus. At my profession of faith, I declared that I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, was that He was? Uh, at my profession of faith, I declared that I believed in, G- in the Lord Jesus Christ and what He has done for me on the cross. To me, this was a real experience and liberating to know that God's love is perfect, and that no matter what I do, Jesus always loves me and paid for me for my sin in full. I've been, been married almost 50, 25 years to Amelia. Um, who to me is a faith rock, a godly woman, an encourager, and has such an incredible love for Jesus. I must admit that there were certain times that was challenging in my life, uh, such as me and Amelia um, having difficulty to fall pregnant, um, and now we have three beautiful children. There were false accusations at work at times, I went through retrenchment, and at times where I drifted a bit from God, specifically in my university days, but I always believed in God's love and provision for me. The Bible to me is the example of why I believe. It's such a solid book. It consists of thousands of pages. Uh, It's 66 books written over centuries by different authors, and yet there's not one word that contradicts each other. If you seek an answer in the Bible, you will find it. Um, And and I can testify for that throughout my life. In recent years, I really started to grappling with the idea of baptism. Uh, Yes, I've been baptized as a baby, and I did a profession of faith. But why does the Bible Bible still say you have to be baptized? I always read it that if you are a non-believer and become a believer, you must be baptized. But for me, that has been a believer all my life, and did a profession of faith. I don't need to be baptized. The question that kept on haunting me was, why was Jesus baptized? And I then read Matthew 3, verse 15, that says, But Jesus said, It should be done, for we must carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to baptize Jesus. I therefore came to the personal conviction that I have to be obedient to what God requires and to follow the example of Jesus to be baptized, even though I have been a Christian and believer for many years. I also know that God is not finished with me and He still wants to bless and use me. What I can testify over the years is that God has been good for me. I love the song, A Reckless Love, where it says, God has been so, so good to me, as I can relate to every word in that song throughout my life. I also continue to stand amazed on the miracles, big and small, God is still doing every day. I just look at the church auditorium we're standing in today, um, the acquisition of the neighboring properties, the whole building process, the, the city church venue, and just again, as um, Twigs mentioned as well, the money that came in from that, 
one cannot question God's, ha God's hand and miracle and all of that. I love being part of the Bridgie community. It helps me motivate and support me in my faith. My favorite Bible verses are Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. You are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And Isaiah 40 uh, verse 30. Even, though, even youth grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not get weary. They will walk and not be faint. I therefore want to declare again today that Jesus is my Lord and Savior, that he died for my sins, and there's nothing that I can do to earn God's forgiveness, but I want to serve him for what he has done for me. Thank you. How good is that? Praise God. Powerful story. And just your hunger and your desire to keep growing the Lord. Paul is so powerful. So we want to pray a blessing over you right now. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for Paul's testimony. Lord, we thank you for the spiritual heritage that he has been blessed with, Lord. We want to thank you too for his hunger and his desire to keep growing in you, great God. It's true, Lord. You're not done yet, not by far, great God. So much more you long to do in and through Paul's life, Lord, to use him powerfully for your kingdom purposes. And so, Lord, I want to pray this very night for a fresh anointing of your Holy Spirit over Paul's life. Fill him afresh to overflowing, I pray. Oh, Lord, fan to flame in an even greater measure than ever before the gifts and abilities that you have given to him, the calling that is over his life, I pray. And Lord, I pray you continue to use him as you're already doing, I know, Lord, but even in, in greater measure, multiply, Lord, the influence and impact he's having on young lives in, in the sporting arena, Lord, in his family, in this church, Lord, beyond that as well, great God. Just continue to anoint him, give him opportunities, I pray. Continue to open many doors, I pray, for him to be able to declare again, Lord, your goodness, your faithfulness and all, Lord Jesus, that you have done for him, great God. Thank you for his wife, Amelia, here with him in the pool as well, Lord. Thank you for the blessing that it is to do the journey together for these cup, this couple. And so, Lord, we just commit them to you now and pray, Lord, particularly for Paul, just your blessing over his life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Paul, let me ask you, do you confess Jesus as your Lord and Saviour? I do. Well, this profession of your faith and because you requested it is a great privilege for Amelia and for myself to baptise in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. just for your blessing. Thank you, great God, that we can turn to you as an example. Lord, what an awesome night it's been just to worship you, to hear Paul's story tonight, what you've done in and through his life, great God. And I pray that in this very place, those that are watching online, that you'd raise up a generation of people that, that, that people can look to, to be an example, to be a faith father, a faith mother, that people can turn to and look to and follow that example, great God. We thank you so much. We love you so much. And we just continue to pray that blessing over the next generation, the next generation, the next generation to see your kingdom move forward in great power and measure, great God. So we love you, Lord. We worship you and we honour you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Hey, so good to have you online. I just want to say that and here as well. But I just want to say one last thing before we finish tonight. There was something that struck me as Matt was sharing and specifically as he shared about, uh, you know, rising up and taking responsibility to be the faith father and the faith mother. And, and it just, there was something that I thought about. If you've ever thought about uh, getting involved in a ministry area, whether it's helping out in youth or helping out in young adults or helping out in the kids ministry, if you've ever thought about that, but never committed to that, don't miss the opportunity tonight to say, hey, I, I really sense that I need to step up. And you can speak to a leader in one of those roles or speak to one of us as a, as a pastoral team to help let you or give you the opportunity to, to, to stand up and take responsibility and to play a role there. And so don't miss that opportunity. But God bless you so much. Uh, whatever you're doing this week, may you, God use you this week and uh, we'll see you next Sunday. Thanks for being here. Well, thanks for joining with us for our service today. If you sense God speaking to you, we'd love to help you on the journey of faith. You can reach out to us by emailing hello at bridgman.org.au or if you have a prayer need, don't forget to email us at prayer at bridgman.org.au and we'd love to pray for you. 
Thanks so much for sharing with us today and we look forward to connecting with you again soon.